Hi, this is David Weiss of sonicscoop.com. Welcome everyone to this extremely awesome edition of MixCon 2020. I've got two very special guests with me today to discuss two very special plugins from Isotope. Isotope, thank you once again for being a MixCon sponsor and making this amazing information available to the MixCon community. My guests will be giving us a totally inside scoop on Isotope's recently introduced Stutter Edit 2 and their totally new just launched Neoverb. Allow me to introduce them. We'll start with Josh Kuiperstock. Josh is a sound designer at Isotope and has worked on products such as Ozone 9, RX7, Insight 2, Vocal Synth 2, and most recently, Stutter Edit 2 and Neoverb. As a graduate from Berklee College of Music's electronic production design program, Josh also continues to produce, DJ, and compose electronic music under the alias Smigonaut. Josh, great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Good to be here. All right. And now, next, I am profoundly psyched to introduce our second guest, BT. Hey, BT. Hey, it's Hello. great to see you guys. I was going to throw in some love for Josh's Glitch Hop project. I'm glad you said that. He's a wizard with the oh. Glitch Hop stuff. For you're real. Too, you're too kind. <laughs> I mean it, man. I, I mind. Yeah, I, that. I totally mean it. We yeah, it's great to win. be here. Great to be with you guys. BT, thanks. And, and we're going to link to that in the, in the, uh, in the comments, uh, if, if you will allow us, Josh. So we'll... Oh. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you I'm serious, too. You'd be missing out to not. All right, we're going to spread the word. BT is a man whose music has had a profound influence in the world on and on me, both as an electronic music producer and maybe even more so as a music fan. A composer, musician, technologist, and creator, BT has been making waves and waveforms for decades. A true electronic <laughs> music pioneer, the Grammy-nominated BT's work includes landmark albums such as Movement in Still Life, Emotional Technology, These Hopeful Machines, and his just-released release, The Lost Art of Longing. The inventor of the stutter edit, from whose mind sprang Isotope stutter edit too, we are thrilled to have him on MixCon. BT, welcome once again. Oh, man, my pleasure, and thank you so much for all the kind words, and I'm thrilled to be here and talking with you guys. This is great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I could go on. And I, I can't even think how many hours I've logged listening to your music. Uh, oh, that means the world to me, man. Thank yeah. you so much. I love hearing that. Great. Well, let's dive in. We've got, we've got a lot of stuff to geek out on. So Isotope has just released Music Production Suite 4, a collection of over 30 audio plugins, including Ozone 9, Neutron 3, Nectar 3 Plus, RX8, and Neoverb plus one year of tutorials from Groove 3, along with Stereo Reverbs, R4, and Nimbus. Get time-saving AI-powered audio software tools that assist at every step of the workflow to help you get professional quality mixes and masters quickly. So tonight we'll be spending lots of time on two of the included plugins, the aforementioned Stutter Edit 2 and the brand new Neoverb. They're both part of Music Production Suite 4. So are you ready? Let's dive in. We'll start with Stutter Edit 2, which lets you create the famous stutter editing effect with one button to slice and dice your samples, tracks, and mixes. You can fire off rhythmic gestures, sweeping filters, glitchy effects, or everything at once. Of course, you can discover all of this at isotope.com. So BT, what led you, what led to the development of Stutter Edit as a plugin? and then to collaborating with Isotope on the first edition on Stutter Edit 1? That's, that's a great question. The Stutter Edit journey is a, a long one. And um, I've, I've told this story before, and so I'll try to keep it succinct. But the, 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 this idea of Stutter Editing really comes from a summer job I had when I was about 14 years old, which was tape opping at a local studio and I tape opted at this amazing studio in, in Rockville, Maryland called Omega Studios and the engineers were kind enough to teach me how to splice quarter inch tape and you know I got I cleaned coffee mugs and bathrooms and put mics back in the mic cabinets and that kind of thing and at night I would experiment 
with cutting quarter inch tape. And so the very first idea that that kind of sprang forth from, from this tape editing was an idea of nonlinearity, which of course at the time was, you know, kind of inaccessible other than actually physically, mechanically doing it using tape. So one of the first experiments that I did involving this kind of nonlinearity that jumping forward is really what stutter edit is about is kind of recontextualizing something into a buffer and making this really you know exotic kind of non-linear rhythmic effect out of audio that's processed in layers upon layers of dig digital signal processing so the original idea came from this crazy i thought i had one night which was i wonder how long at 15 inches per second a 120 beat per minute bar is in quarter inch tape. And so I sat down with a paper and, and pencil. I don't remember the actual BPM, but let's say it was 120 and figured it out. So, and then my first realization was if I subdivide that bar in half, then if I cut, literally physically cut that piece of tape and leader it in half, that's, those are half notes. And if I cut it in quarters, those are quarter notes and eighth notes and so on and so forth. And so, it was just one of the most remarkable things I, I, I've ever done in my life to this day to take a couple bars of music, lay them out on the floor, leader them with a grease, mark them with a grease pencil, splice them with a razor blade on an, on an iron block and put them back together in a different order and listen to that and listening to, you know, maybe a snare drum reverb abruptly cutting on beat and then you know, followed by eighth notes from different parts of a bar uh, with, I think probably eighth notes were the extent of it at the time too, if I'm being honest. Um, and so it was just this remarkable epiphany of, wow, this is something I've, I've never heard ever in my, in my life before ever. And, and uh, interestingly too, my teachers as a kid, I studied at conservatory and stuff, talked to me about music concrete and so I, I, you know, I'd studied things like uh, Marcel Duchamp and the art of noise and some of these kind of things and, and was interested in this idea of using tape for sound effects, right? Which is what a lot of the original sort of progenitors of the music on Cret movement were doing. But most of it was, you know, arrhythmic. And so this to me was this very new thought. So jump forward. I started, you know, I was mowing lawns to get my first samplers and I started to do some of these techniques in machines like the Akai S900, eventually uh, some of the uh, Insonic samplers. And then uh, eventually, lo and behold, came the first nonlinear digital audio editing platforms. We didn't call them DAWs at the time. And the first that I remember and, and was able to use was sound tools. So this is pre Pro Tools is a two track sort of stereo editing, you know, program. And this is where I really kind of honed in and locked in these techniques and actually started applying not just rhythmic cutting, but applying over a series of rhythmic edits, which we now call gestures applying digital signal processing operations like reverbs, like flanges and phases, delay lines and these kind of things. And then it, it just turned into this technique. And then eventually I started applying maths to the curve. So instead of just jumping from one value to another value, I would interpolate between values and interpolate with, you know, slope, you know, an exponential slope or sometimes even things like hamming curves and I, all these things. I did all of these manually. They were all done by hand on all of my first records through the 90s. And I realized how much I personally needed, almost like a development tool for myself to help automate the process because it was insanely arduous. Some of, some of uh, my, my song, uh, Simply Being Loved, that is actually in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most ever recorded edits in a in a, in a performance, vocal edits in a recorded performance that took literally a month of just editing the vocal, some single bar figures of that 
took days and days and days. And so really the first things that I did was uh, built a Max patch and then uh, a C sound. I started the C sound patch and then I built a Max patch. I was performing with that in the late nineties. And then um, I put up signs around Los Angeles and I found some programmers uh, at local universities and I gave them an internship and then I ended up hiring a few and we were having hackathons on my couch while, you know, I was supposed to be scoring films. So when I showed up at Isotope and Mark, the incredible CEO for Isotope would tell you the same thing. I showed up with this fully working plugin, like a fully baked realized version of this plugin. Now it wasn't cross platform. The UI was not terrific admittedly but um, showed up with a really well annotated working code base for stutter edit. And so, and, and also too, and, and break tweaker. And so um, it really was this labor of love that came from a, a need in my own work to create this. And it's just been this long arc of crazy audio editing and to see it in other people's hands and how other people have used it so incredibly in ways that I, I would have never imagined myself is just absolutely thrilling. And working with Isotope folks is unbelievable. They're some of the smartest people and, and not saying that because Josh is sitting here either. I, I have, I just enjoy such an incredible relationship with uh, the folks at, at Isotope and there's some of the most brilliant engineers that I've met full stop in the music space working at Isotope and in a lot of other disciplines as well too. So they're just a great group of people, incredible to work with. Their ideas are sort of second to none. And we've just had like an amazing time. I miss our development meetings so Me much too. right now. <laughs> it's like there's like a hole in my week, not having our weekly Zoom call. So I can't wait till we work on something else. But um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's been a labor of love, honestly, making this. And so Getting Stutter Edit 2 out the door, one of the biggest things was, I've talked a lot, I'll throw this last thought in there. You mentioned, you know, the kind of complexity that is afforded to you in using something like Stutter Edit with a single key down. And I agree with all that wholeheartedly and I appreciate you saying that so much. Um, and, and one of the really strong marching orders with making Stutter Edit 2 was I noticed a really large void in the market of people wanting to do rhythmic multi effects. And I see people doing these crazy automation maps with something like the serum effects or, you know, massive chain of audio effects. And I really wanted to make stutter edit two so that you could completely bypass the buffer cutting aesthetic of it, which it's a very recognizable sound and it's an awesome sound. I love it to death. But I wanted people to be able to do things that had this kind of rhythmic, undulating rhythmic fluidity to them, but were not buffer cut or could be, you know, just in one part of a two bar phrase, one short little chop. Right. And so Sutter Edit 2 can do these incredibly nuanced, sophisticated rhythmic multi effects that Stutter Edit 1 just absolutely could never even dream of doing so it really is a remarkable jump between the two plugins so there you go right wow incredible uh, there's so many questions i want to ask you i'm i'm gonna have to save some of them for another time but one thing i really wanted to ask you about that about this process of turning it into a plugin is a lot of artists when they discover a sound uh they they're very resolutely want to hang on to it keep that sound theirs uh but you got to a point where you want to share it and share the ability to do that how do you make that leap from being like this is me this is my sound to saying i want to share this with the world that's a phenomenal question that's literally one of my favorite questions i've ever been asked um because it speaks directly to the core of a personal sort of belief system which is this, and I can summarize it really simply. If you are your instruments or your effects or whatever those things are, if your musical output are those things, I personally believe you really need to rethink your musical output. So, um, yeah, that's the simplest I can say it, is one of the most thrilling things 
is to share the things that you come up with that are bespoke and unique and um you know this is very much a part of your sound because i think it does it's kind of i can split it into two things it keeps you evolving and it keeps you discovering and finding new things and the second thing is it democratizes something that other people will use differently than you use it so it's it's so true it's such a prevalent kind of i don't know like thought in in the creative space is people hold these secrets really close to their chest i remember without without calling them out by name a very famous group from the the 90s had a lot of songs in films i love their music and i was sitting with those guys at a festival and i said to them man that kick drum on this one track that they had it was a big track in in england it was all over the radio and stuff and i said the kick drum on a track the compression on that kick drum is just remarkable what is that and they're like we would never tell you that and i i was like wow so first of all i like shut down you know what i mean so i was like kind of like oh yeah. sorry like didn't mean to offend you or anything and then secondly i just realized years later wow i mean how can you make sustainable art if you're guarding what compressor you're using on your kick drum so you know with uh, as if it's some sort of national secret so i i love making up things and then using them in my workflow and then making them into something that can be shared and enjoyed by other people so one of the most thrilling parts of of what i get to to do so i i I just i can't say enough about how it keeps me evolving and then i get this thrilling you know other piece of like getting other people getting to hear you know ben burtz do the asteroid flybys and star wars using stutter edit like if i guarded that you know like it was some kind of military secret or something like i wouldn't get to have that moment there's so thrilling so um yeah so anyway um there you go i got it well that's great that's that's fabulous no, i think that's completely consistent with someone who wants to share their music uh, should want to share their techniques as well and, and the ability to do that but like you i i've i've seen as a journalist in this field i've certainly seen both sides uh, people who can't wait to share how they do it and others who who want to keep it really close. Well, yeah. Josh, let's talk about your role in enabling BT's sharing of the stutter edit techniques with the plugin. Tell us about tell us a little bit about what you do as a sound designer at Isotope and then how does it, how did that lead to being part of the development team for Stutter Edit 2? Sure. Um yeah, before I do, I just want to say uh BT, I I like respect that philosophy like so much. And I think it's like such an important uh, tenet of, of, of uh, the, the desire to like want to give back the, the techniques that, that you use in order to like, cause I, I just feel like it just like furthers like the artistic uh, zeitgeist for lack of a better word, just like- no, I love it, it man. I agree it going forward. I appreciate um, that. Uh, to, to answer your question, so I, I'm a sound designer at Isotope um, that, you know, when you hear the term sound designer, you sort of have this idea of, you know, what that is, you know, especially in regards to a specific industry, you know, it means something in video games, it means something at film, and it certainly means something uh, at, at a company like Isotope. Uh, I do find myself wearing a lot of different hats. Um, you know, I, as, you know, as one might expect, I, I contribute with a, a lot of the, uh, the presets and oversee uh, presets and sounds that go in the final products as, as in addition to the many phenomenal uh, sound designers on our team. Um, but what I love about this job is uh, it also involves a very uh, uh, just sort of uh, focused uh, involvement in the actual uh, development of the products themselves in terms of helping to recommend and shape um, how product features are formed, uh, you know, giving input on, uh, you know, things like signal flow or, or just kind of how, basically how different features will ultimately sound. So we sort of act as, uh, in, in a way, like consultants throughout product development to just kind of help guide how 
the, how the experience, how the sonic experience of using our products will ultimately come across to our, our users. Um, you know, if you're, if you're moving this slider, how is it going to react and why is it going to react the way that it does, you know, things like that. So, so it, it goes pretty deep into that realm too, which is a very uh, exciting process uh, to be a part of. Um, you know, so during my time here, I've, I've, I've worked on, uh, you know, several products, including, uh, you know, Ozone 9, Stutter Edit 2. Um, so when, when I was asked to participate in the, uh, the, in the development of Stutter Edit 2, which was a super fun project, I share BT's uh, fondness and nostalgia for our, uh, our uh, you know, weekly development meetings, because we definitely yeah. had a few yeah. laughs there. Um, it was largely um, just kind of as a way to help bring, uh, you know, my experience uh, from working on products as, at Isotope to sort of help bring this to the finish line. I mean, you know, when it when it was brought to us, I mean, it was it was a largely uh, you know fleshed out thing. Um, you know, I mean, it was it was a usable. Um, it, it was it was very you know usable as a as a product at that point. But you know, I, I basically. Kind of helped to sort of unify um, just kind of how that experience was for the user by way of you know contributing um, you know any remaining presets, helping to sculpt some of the default settings and curves uh, that are in the plugin, um, and also you know helping to give any input regarding um, you know thoughts about you know as I was mentioning before you know how how certain uh, parameters function, uh, et cetera, um, in addition to, um, yeah, just kind of giving guidance and, and input on on that side of things as well, um, if that makes sense. Um, Absolutely. So, so, so really it was just kind of, it was a highly collaborative experience um, and, you know, ultimately like just kind of trying to figure out, okay, how, how, how can we really bring this to the finish line in a way that um, you know, it sort of kind of embodies the values um, that kind of we hold as a, as a sound design department and, you know, is also uh, kind of consistent with, you know, some of what people might, might expect in terms of like, you know, how, how some of our, our other similar products work and really just kind of bring it into the family in the most cohesive uh, way. Um, mm -hmm. And we had a blast doing it. It was a lot of fun. I yeah, I love too. I love that plugin. <laughs> yeah, me too. I use it all the time. Um, Josh, uh, I have a hundred questions for you now, but sure. I, I'm I'm going to have to hold it down to one. Hearing you talk about the way you think about the interactions with faders or other other controls within the plugin makes me want to say: Is there a way to characterize the the unique psychology of Stutter Edit too? Uh, what what is the distinct connection that you're trying to make with the user for this plugin that's perhaps different from other Isotope plugins? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I, th I think um, what what makes Stutter Edit unique, well, Stutter Edit two now unique uh, is its um, playability, and and I, I I consider it very strongly to be like a like a plugin that you can use as an instrument, you know, as well as a mixing tool. Um, I totally agree. Yeah, That's when I, almost identical to what I would have said, Josh. <laughs> I super agree with that. Yeah, I mean, anytime I open it, it's um, you know, I, I don't always know. In fact, I often don't know what I'm going to do with it when I open it. Um, but it becomes pretty clear after a few minutes of, of using it. Um, and I've just gotten lost for like hours, just kind of like playing through the gestures on like a, a, a loop or groove that I actually just like forget to record my ideas. I'm having so much fun. So it's just <laughs> like, you know, I, I would say, you know, a stutter edit two in comparison to, you know, you know, things we use at, at like, or things we've developed like Neutron or Ozone, which I also use uh, all the time. Um, you know, th those are really just kind of really trying to help um, 
you know, our users' productions sound as good as, as humanly possible, um, you know, and, and get them ready to have their productions like elevated to stand up against all of the other phenomenal productions that are out there in the world and really help to empower, uh, you know, independent musicians to put out really phenomenal sounding music in that way. Whereas Stutter Edit, um, it's, it's, it's uh, an injection of, of more like kind of creative uh, parameter uh, mangling, as it were. You know, yeah. like I, you know, the, the amount of different, like, you know, kind of reverb tails and distortion and all this stuff that you can use simultaneously as uh, BT was describing, um, it can really kind of make you unlock new possibilities. So I would say it's, it's, it's much more of a like performance tool and also a compositional tool. Like these days, the, the line between like, you know, production and composition and mixing, you know, it's so, it's so blurred. And oftentimes, you know, people who make music have to do like all of that stuff at once, you know, so this is just kind of another piece of the puzzle and stutter at it really helps with kind of just like that baseline, like arrangement of, um, you know, of, of music, uh, which is, is, it, it can be so easy to get stuck there, especially, you know, you know, similar to what you were talking about BT, just kind of like, you know, the, the time consumption of like these very like finite adjustments, especially in genres like electronic music, where, you know, you'll expect a glitch every now and again, or like mm -hmm. a cool, just like transitional fill that would otherwise like, you know, take hours, you know, can really just take a second um, if it's Literally, programmed into like, a gesture. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's inspiring and, and quick, um, you know, and it helps move compositions forward. So I love that. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Absolutely. I, I well, totally terrific. Agree. Well, in the words of a great Canadian band, show, don't tell, <laughs> let's hit, and I'm speaking of Rush, of course. <laughs> of course. Which <laughs> album was that? Was that Presto? Uh, anyway, let's, let's, let's hear some of Stutter Edit too. Uh, yeah, Josh, sure. you're, you're actually going to drive this, right? Yep. BT, I want you to do like a play-by-play, -play, all right? Like yeah, I would love commentary. to. Uh, I would love to. Be like, cool. that was awesome. No, <laughs> whatever, however you guys want to interact on it. But let, let's let's check this out. All right. Now I got to do the old. I love what Zoom. Josh said about this in incredible sort of blurring between the compositional, the arrangement, and the mixing process. I just <laughs> was having like a moment to self reflecting on being a teenager. And so I literally had a flash of an engineer telling me, oh, well, I can't remember what it was, probably like a D50. And he was like, okay, you have to bypass the effects to print this. And like, but that's like the sound. Why would we bypass them to print it and then make them later? And it's so, if you think about the evolution and thought from that time period until now, there's this incredible fluidity between mixing and producing and engineering and like josh i agree totally one of the most exciting things about stutter edit too is using it as this compositional tool so i'll have you know four or five stems i'll open them in live because live is so simple to work in and i'll take each one and i'll put a stutter edit on it and I'm, i might have like a controller where and just switch between the channels put everything in record into the arrange page and just go through firing off gestures on different stems, on the drums, on the vocals, on the bass, on the keyboards. And then the, just these magical moments will happen. And then you can go back, quantize it, print it and pull it into your main session. And, and uh, sometimes I can very easily take an eight bar, the kind of dreaded eight bar loop and have four or five stutter, edit op stutter edits open and uh, come up with an arrangement in a matter of minutes. And I always find that to be the, the most creatively debilitating part of the process arranging. And it's when I lean in to stutter at it too a lot personally, I use it a lot in that way. So 100%. Um, yeah, so uh, can I think you all can see my screen. We got yep. Stutter Edit 2 up here. I've just got a, got this kind of, um, you know, simple sort of like disco, almost Daft Punk inspired thing going on. Um, you know, 
a nice little groove, and I have, um, so right now, uh, this stutter edit is on what I've uh, grouped as other, which is basically everything but the drum beat. Okay. So it's got this sort of like, sort of a kind of Tycho style guitar, some keys and some uh, side chain bass. Um, and I have these three triggers right here. We have the drums trigger, the other trigger, and then the, the master trigger. So those are all triggering separate instances of stutter edit, one of which is on the master bus. So let's see what happens when I just kind of go through a few sounds on the other bus. just keep going i had to kind of stop myself because it's, I was it's having crazy all <laughs> it, it's one of those things that one of those moments can can completely change the pocket of the record that you're making i love that so much as an example it is really good for you called it an other bus and i like that josh i, I often will do this with my synth bus and I mean, one of the things we, forgive me i'm kind of thread hijacking a little bit here but we didn't mention it a really big distinction between stutter edit two and stutter edit one and a very requested feature is we've got something in there that we call auto mode now so you can in fact play it like an effect like stutter edit one and if you find a gesture that works fantastic on your whole synth bus you just put it in auto mode and lock it to that gesture and then it acts like on you know air quotes a regular effect right so it just plays that gesture at tempo across the sum totality of whatever you got it on so what just just demonstrated like there were like four moments in there where i was like oh that one oh no wait that's even better oh no wait that one and you just take one of those you pick that gesture throw it on your other bus or your synth bus or whatever it is and you can leave it on for the the entire song and it just does these like exotic combination side chain and you know a little bit of gating sort of like called in the colloquial trance gating but different because it's not just bound to 16th notes it can have these little bursts of micro rhythms in it it just makes for such great ear candy um and not even that i'm biased i clearly i am but like this is something i can't do any of these things with anything else and it's why i wanted to make it so that's a really cool example of just like a high level kind of macro example of what we're talking about. That's not terrific. Hey, guys, can I ask you one thing for some of our viewers who may not be familiar? When you say a gesture, can you explain exactly what you mean by that? Yeah, I, I got I got that one. If it's cool, Josh, is that cool? Of course. Yeah. So um, so I came up with this name a long time ago for lack of a better descriptor, honestly. And what a gesture is is it's basically okay so simply it is what okay i'll give you another name that i call it sometimes but gesture seems to have stuck is a macro rhythm so it's a space of time where there's a micro rhythm happening in between so it's a series typically of small notes where there's a beginning point and an end point. There are effects that are being executed over that time period. Sometimes many different effects in parallel or in series. It's another cool thing about Stutter Edit 2. You can reorder all the effects. So you're executing effects and you're cutting a sound into small slices. That's what I call a gesture. So you could think of it as like a macro rhythm. So it could be a quarter note where there's a burst of 1,024th notes, mm. right? And okay. the whole thing could be flanged and it could have a reverb and so on and so forth. But the duration of that gesture is a quarter note, right? Internally, it's got all these small, complex note figures and it could be splining and interpolating between note values. And like I said, tons of digital signal processing. So that's what a gesture is. And what's so cool about Stutter Edit is, I call it the cat on the keyboard effect. Like you can't make a mistake because the gestures are bound to clock. 
So you can have it so that, and you can select, and of course the presets have these defined and they can be changed too, but you can have it so that these gestures no quantize. In fact, they default to no quantizing. So you can have it on your middle C so that you can only trigger that gesture every quarter note. And it lasts for a whole bar if you want, but you can only trigger it on quarter notes. So you can literally lean on the keyboard <laughs> and you're gonna get something cool because all of the gestures are quantized how they fire. So they never fire off grid, if that makes sense. That's amazing. And uh, BT, that made me want to ask you though, you said you, you talk about how you can kind of do no wrong uh, with, with a lot of these settings and with stutter edit too. But in your experience, have you ever heard where a stutter edit doesn't apply, doesn't work? Sure. Yeah, I have. And I think it's, it, it it's, uh, reminds me of a, a good friend of mine who's uh, an amazing guitarist. I've mentioned him a couple times in some of these uh, isotope interviews, actually, that, that I've done. His name's Richard Fortas. He plays guitar for Guns N' Roses. He's an incredible guitarist, one of the best musicians I've ever met in my life. And he literally, he could play sweep arpeggio so fast that it's terrifying. You can't even see his fingers. The, one of the most fun things in the world is to go into a guitar shop with Richard and um just sit him down and I, I literally i've been on tour with richard this is pre guns and roses days where we would just go into some small town this is a movement and still life tour and you know we would go in and richard and i would sit down on a guitar amp he'd pick up a guitar and start playing and they'd close the shop and i'm, I'm not joking either it's not hyperbole that's happened probably three times wow in sitting with he's, he's that good right so what's even better about richard than his playing prowess and his vast knowledge of harmony and theory the fact that he's almost a better drummer than he is guitarist it's it's repulsive honestly he's so gifted um what's even better about his musicality is he he knows when not to play right so right he's somebody that like can play a stooges song you know three chord or a ramon song and be totally content doing it and really feel it internally like take on those three chords and live that for five minutes and um not have this want or need to show off for lack of a better word so i think the key to something like and it's part of again the design aesthetic of this second stutter edit the key to using something like stutter edit or anything really that is an effect for that matter is subtlety right and musicality like you want to use it in subtle and musical ways and so a lot of that is baked into the design of stutter edit too and certain banks of gestures thank you josh who he was hyper involved in all of that um the way that we've designed the curves so that it ends up yielding very musical sound so i can't point a finger at something where it's like oh wow that went horribly wrong but what i will say is I think that stutter edit is such a uh, it's such an exotic, cool sound that you you really want it to shine out at moments. So, um, you know, that's when I see it used most effectively. I guess is the best way I can say it. Right, right. Got it. that. That's a terrific answer. That that sheds a lot of light. Well, what I'm thinking is, Josh, let let's give you permission. To go to town now you were you were a little you were a little modest you're a little shy let's let's take take 60 full seconds or or even two minutes uh, give, us a, give us a stutter edit to jam Warm hole patches <laughs> all right let's, let's see what happens yeah. um well yeah i got this uh synth bank that i'm a big fan of um bt synth bus bank and uh so all right let's see what we Hold on a second. All right, and and I'll stop you. You you can go. I'm I'm setting a timer here. It's not me. It's not you. This timer is is the bad guy. Oh, this these drums are in reverse for some reason. <laughs> so I, I noticed that. I'm I'm gonna I want to do a little bit more on the other here. Oh, you know what? Did I accidentally press the? 
I think you did. <laughs> I was like, is that stutter in it? That doesn't make any sense. We're doing it live, folks. <laughs> Uh, I was like, yeah, I must have uh, pressed R, which I believe is the reverse. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, classic. Anyway, let's go. Now is a really good. Oh, I did it again. So I'm admittedly using my computer keyboard to trigger. Yeah, you're using gestures. your QWERTY keyboard to trigger. <laughs> so yeah. I just I just got to make sure not to use the R key. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. There's our reverb. That's ridiculous. These are effects you spend so much time doing by hand. Yeah, for real. And uh, as you can see, like with each one, it's just the, the, the UI switches with each one, which represents each individual gesture okay. that's tied to each note. Um, so yeah, I mean, literal hours of, uh, of possibilities there. And uh, I was kind of, if you'll notice, I was kind of going across uh, each, you know, each track uh, or bus that I had stutter edit on to, I guess, kind of showcase. I totally. mean, you know, you could do it on individual tracks, buses, uh, the master. Um, and, you know, we got kind of presets to, to highlight all those different use cases, you know, a whole master bus section, some experimental sections. We have a cinematic and trailers, you know, if you're a film composer or working on, um, you know, kind of a cinematic, uh, uh, uh piece of music for a trailer or a piece of film or even video games you can uh, use some of the effects in there um, i'm hearing course, those i'm actually hearing those a lot the elephant in the room too is the the very famous kind of stutter edit effect you hear commonly on vocals and it sounds incredible on vocals and it's like that effect this is a way more evolved version of that hyper buffer cut vocal sound that you can do with it and again just to say like for the hundredth time you can do these subtle things with it some of which josh was doing in his first pass at this that are so cool to use as a loop on a variety of different instruments or things as exotic as kind of a neuro bass figure you know um some of the some of the guys that do amazing neuro bass stuff like noisia and cohen sound system and some of these guys have been talking to me about how they're using stutter edit too and they're using it in bass sound design literally just on their bass stem after they've got a bunch of different sounds kind of fully formed and then performing it into their daw and but them and other people have told me you know the sounds that we're coming up with this are just crazy i mean we don't have time to show you everything but the distortion alone you know it has a it has a midpoint, so it's two bands of distortion, and you can actually move the midpoint rhythmically using one of the curves that you see on the screen with two totally different distortion types. You can automate the distortion amount, how hard it's pushing into each band of distortion while the distortion point is switching rhythmically. And so for that kind of neuro bass music, bass house kind of sound design stuff, it's ridiculous you know for sound design things i'm hearing those trailer patches a lot of my friends that do trailer and commercial work 
are, you know, have been texting and emailing and saying like, oh my gosh, man, we're used to stuff like That's crazy. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I'm so proud of it. I'm, I'm really proud of what we've made here. And uh, just, just, I mean, it kind of goes without saying, but a, a really different aesthetic thing to start at one is now instead of just a beginning point and an end point, every single parameter in the whole plugin has a curve associated with it. So you're not just going from point A to point B with such and such curve. You're actually able to go to point C, D, E, F, wherever you want to spline, to interpolate, to jump. We use a modifier key shift to uh, snap to grid. And you can just, and you can do this to a, a freaking compressor. <laughs> you, it's crazy. Like you can do these kind of automation things to a compressor. I have patches or banks, Stephen, that I've made that are quite literally just using our master bus limiter and just automating that. That's the entire bank are these rhythmic master bus automation. So I'd encourage people, just a final thought here, I'd encourage people to when they when they get stutter edit to one of the most fun things to do is to go through first of all open it try all the presets on anything and you're you'll freak out but to go through once you're in the kind of learning it phase and want to make some of your own patches go effect by effect and see how crazy of sounds you can make in every effect and you'll end up making whole banks of sounds just based on a comb filter. I guarantee it, or just based on distortion, just based on the limiter. Forget about it with the reverb. You know, <laughs> I've made 50 banks of things with the reverb. So um, it's it, it really is, just to underscore what Josh was saying, I think a really key differentiator with Stutter Edit 2 is just a lot of fun. It's really fun and really inspiring and you can find it to add, you know, substantially to any kind of music that you're making inside right. of DAW. So. Wow, it, it looks fabulous. All I can keep thinking when I see it is how much I wish I'd had it when I was producing electronic music, like heavily and routinely. And, yeah. and just the work I did, like trying to emulate stutter edits by hand myself uh, and that, if I'd had this, I never would have come out like there's. Yeah. So, I hear you, man. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be interviewing you here today. I'd, I'd just be there oh. in the room. Um, yeah. So now, BT, I'm gonna switch gears for a minute because you hey, you we talked about making this accessible uh, to everyone, but the the fact is that you use Stutter Edit, Stutter Edit to yourself a lot, and especially how you were talking about when to use it subtly. Uh, mm -hmm. versus not because when i listened to your new album the lost art of longing i, I loved it i it's there's so many Thank great you. tracks on it but when i you kind of worked me into the stutter edits because the first few tracks there's only a few subtle applications of it i was like oh maybe this sure. is not a heavy stutter edit album for bt but then the war came on yeah. and, and well and strong i'm like yeah. wow these are stutter edit symphonies. So you really just broke it open there. Uh, so just tell me about how stutter edits helped you creatively in, in, in one or both of those songs. That's great. And, and I do agree with both of those. And, and just in terms of the way the lost art of longing is sequenced, it kind of lulls you into, okay, so these are just like really pretty big evocative electronic compositions uh where's the kind of signature bt add freak out and it, you get to it as you get into the album so um i think the war is a great example of it you know the the midsection in the war of course the the war is uh an amazing song that i wrote with um uh, irana mancini and um who's an incredible vocalist and so we have this really great song that really is kind of like a down tempo sort of phil specter song at its core and so based on its tempo i had the crazy idea i wonder if i can take something that sort of you know transforms from this kind of down tempo lo-fi phil specter sort of thing 
into trap, into drum and bass, into, you know, what we would call, I guess, IDM and sort of back and sort of to genre jump like that. And so transitionally stutter edit there was just, I, I couldn't have done the piece of music without it, you know, and especially the, the, uh, the section that goes like kind of full autecker in the middle post the first trap drop is really leaning in heavily to stutter edit too. And of course I made a bunch of custom patches and that's when st all the parameters were in one line. It was really hard to, to work in and, um, yeah, but uh, it was just, you know, thrilling to get to use this on this plugin. Just a last thought about it. There is this piece of it, you know, I mentioned how much I love sharing these things with other people. There's this selfish little piece. It's little, but it's there. And it, I would be remiss to not acknowledge it, that I get to have these things that I make for a period of time before they come out. And so <laughs> I'll use them like crazy, you know, as I'm developing them on uh, the music that I'm working on at that time. And it's a really fun time. And I also too feel like I'm cheating during that time if I'm being very honest about it, cause I have this thing other people don't have. Um, but yeah, those two songs in particular, there's some really, uh, really cool uses of Stutter Edit too, and um, yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks for acknowledging that, man. I yeah, really, really appreciate you, that. You got it. And, and Josh, I was impressed when I when I mentioned that to you that you said that you distinctly heard Stutter Edit too had been used on on the record. Like, so I just <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I I you know I can only I can only speculate, but I mean, I have to. <laughs> You know, you have, to, you have to complete confidence. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. So, all right. So we're going to, we're going to get to phase three, the third and final phase of this amazing interview um, uh, to turn our attention to Neoverb. Uh, yes. So uh, for those who are not aware of the specs on Neoverb. So Neoverb is a reverb plugin that combines industry leading exponential audio technology with an intuitive AI powered workflow to help music producers and mix engineers quickly find the right space for their vocals and instruments. Neoverb's reverb assistant feature lets users get to a starting point quickly in real time, can also combine three different reverb engines at once, either through the assistant or with an intuitive blend pad interface, which I love. Other highlights include intelligent pre and post EQs that make suggestions to shape and tame reverb in the mix. So Josh, I wanted to ask you, what was the philosophy beyond, behind Neoverb? What makes this reverb a breakthrough? Sure. Um, so Neoverb is uh, honestly, unlike you know any other uh, reverb plugin uh, I've used, I think something that um, you know, I, I think we were really trying to use as like the great north when uh, putting this together is is the idea that, you know, I mean, reverb can really elevate a sound in a more audible way than, you know, even some more, you know, common effects like uh, EQ uh, and compression just by its very nature. But um, oftentimes, it's really, if if you're a little unclear about what the technical you know, parameters of what a, a reverb can do, it can be very hard to, to get the right reverb sound for your track, one that makes sense. It's very easy to go full force and just have this like amazing lush reverb um, or just kind of go like very subtle, but oftentimes that kind of middle ground, it can be a little difficult um, for, for folks to, uh, you know, to, to kind of uh, conform to, to how it should sound, especially in the context uh, of a mix, you know, because if you have a lot of reverb buildup, that can just kind of, uh, and, and it's very tempting to, to get that because reverb, again, it's like a very audible effect. So, you know, it's very easy to kind of just like add it and add it and add it. And then, you know, maybe there's kind of some mud that comes along with it. Um, so, so this reverb is really just about finding the perfect reverb sound for your track or whatever input source that you want to put it on. And we've done that in several ways. Uh, the most obvious one is this um, blend pad up here, which actually 
blends three different reverb algorithms at once. So I'll, I'll give you kind of a, a before and after, just sort of the default setting on this electric piano here. So that's with it off. On. I said wide. Well, and then, really nice. so as, as you move this XY pad, you're moving across the, the mix and blend of three different reverb types, which are uh, reflected, no pun intended, on the left here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a little bit of reverb humor for you. <laughs> reverb. Um, uh, <laughs> so you have these three different um, algorithms on the left. You have uh, early reflections. You have, um, and then you have the set of advanced controls that you can access here uh, for some more fine tuning. Um, in the middle one, you can choose between a plate and a medium chamber and a room uh, style reverb. And then on the bottom here, you can choose between a hall and a large chamber style reverb. And you have these space macros, um, which just essentially like you know, make bigger <laughs> the size of the, the space of the reverb right. that you are trying to capture. And then this blends between them. So you can do a, a lot of fancy tricks here, but this is just kind of what you see at first. Uh, I think one of the main focuses of this plugin is the reverb assistant, which is similar to the paradigm of uh, many of the other assistants that we provide. You know, Ozone has a master assistant, Nectar has a vocal assistant, uh, Neutron has a mix assistant, so we have a reverb assistant here, and I'll show you how it works real quick. So, say you have this uh, electric piano sound, but you kind of, you want to apply reverb, you're not necessarily sure what you're looking for yet, so we have a few different controls here. Um, this style knob, which goes between realistic and dramatic, so just depending on the effect you want, you can kind of dial in um, you know, how crazy or, I guess, natural the, the reverb is going to sound. So for this, uh, for my example purposes, I'm going to go kind of just a little shy of the middle ground, a little more realistic, but with a, a little bit of extra tail at the end. Uh, a medium sign sounds good to me. And then the tone I want for this is, is uh, I think, uh, a, little, a little darker of a tone um, because of the nature of the instrument. And then you have a dry wet control here. So I'm going to bring it down to maybe, actually I'm going to bring it up a little bit just to exemplify what it's doing. Yeah. So let's go next. It is applying an auto cut, which is the pre-EQ. And then unmask, which is the post reverb EQ. All right, so, so this is what it gave us at first, and I'll play that in the mix. So this is with Neoverb. I'm gonna turn it off. Off. So, I mean, I, I feel like that's a reverb that like I may not have necessarily come to, um, you know, just by like fiddling around with, you know, say Ableton stock reverb and kind of, you know, sure. moving the early reflections or, you know, the, the damping in such a way until, you know, I, I get it just right. I mean, this assistant kind of came up with this reverb that would otherwise require several separate sends of reverb bussing or parallel reverbs. Uh, so you have that aspect of it with the blend knob. It created, you know, several custom EQ curves based on uh, analysis of the input audio that wow. you can engage or disengage. And, and kind of similar to the philosophy of Stutter Edit too, I mean, this is just like a real time saver in terms of diet. I've been using this on like pretty much every, uh, you know, every session is like my new go-to reverb. I'm, I'm a fan as well as an employee, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, just kind of like conforming to the mix in terms of like how your reverb can fit in with it. It's, it's, it's really super useful. And, and I think uh, 
folks are going to really enjoy it, get a lot of use out of it. Uh, in addition, we have um, some modulation here, which gives uh, var varying levels of uh, additional processing, including a chorus. Um, we have this smoothing, um, this smoothing uh, slider here, which kind of helps to tame the, the tails just a little bit. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, just kind of a slew of advanced controls for each one. Uh, one of my favorites being you can actually you can actually sync uh, here. This is actually pretty fun. You can sync um, the. Uh, this is not the most real world example, but just uh, you can sync uh, the tail to the BPM. So nice. so you can just kind of make it like a nice little sharp like. Wow, that's sick, Josh! I didn't know it did that. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a favorite little feature of mine, and I feel like that's kind of you know I've I've heard um, you know, but before we put this out, um, a, a ton of uh, you know producers I know were using like these websites to calculate. Um, I do that delay yeah. calculator. <laughs> right. I do it right. exactly. I'm not joking, exactly. Not Me too. I, I did for a long time, and and you know using using these sites to like calculate the the decay time and the timing of, you know, delay or reverb effects. So, so this is just kind of like another cool, you know, way to, to save some time in that, in that respect. Um, wow. Amazing. Wow. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a load of fun. Josh, I just love how much thought went into the controls here the, and the information that you get, like from the space macro, for example, just the way that, that is represented in that way. It looks so simple, but I imagine that that was not an easy thing to design. Am I correct? Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I gotta uh, give a shout out to our uh, sound designer, uh, Rachel Alex, who's, who's not on the call with us. She's a phenomenal uh, producer and, and sound designer and, and, and she was uh, kind of uh, driving the, uh, the thought behind uh, the, the, the way that these are mapped. And um, to your point, I mean, with with these types of uh, features, there there is a lot of thought into uh, kind of how how these inform the overall uh, experience of the plugin. Um, and and while I, I uh, and, and you know every every decision, you know, there's a lot of different uh, layers of uh, thought behind you know what will be the the best way to to present these ideas and you know there's a lot of uh variation uh during the development process you know but but ultimately um you know kind of similar similarly to how how we worked with stutter edit too it's a it's a highly collaborative um collaborative process and uh yeah i mean it, it can you know there, there is definitely a, a lot of thought that that goes into sort of how these will sort of culminate to to make the experience that makes the the most sense. You can kind of you can you can get a little lost in it <laughs> if you're not careful. Um, you know, sometimes it's it's best to to overthink things less. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in, in any case, we're we're super super stoked on uh, on how it came out, and um, you know, you sort of just have these three different layer, layers of granularity with how you can uh, interact with your reverb between the assistant, the blend pad, and then these advanced uh, controls here, um, you know. So yeah, it's just a, a joy to work with and we're, we're super uh, excited that, um, you know, it's finally out there and, and we've uh, added it to the uh, music production suite family. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, you've really awesome. covered the bases. Uh, BT, uh, having, having the opportunity to have you here when we're talking about reverb, I want to say that when I think of you and reverb, what I think of is the, the thought you put into the reverb on, on your vocalists. Uh, that uh, I really think that, that I hear just such beautiful reverbs uh, on, on their singing. And it seems to me that it's something that, that you put a lot of thought into, or that you have sure. very specific ideas in mind. Uh, can you tell us about your philosophy on reverb in general and, and how you do apply it to vocals? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I mentioned off camera that reverb is sort of my love language, right? Being a kind of eighties kid, I grew up on, and just noting something that you said, Josh, how, how easy it is to get lost in these big lush reverbs and 
knowing how and when to apply those things is a part of the subtlety and nuance of making great records. And some, some, a tool like you just showing, like Neoverb, is going to help. It's what I love about, you know, it's kind of one of those things. It's like you have to uh, participate in making the future you want to live in. And so I, I love that about making music software is you can make these products that help make better music. And it, there's like this cultural add to that. That's just really cool kind of thing. Anyway, just sort of footnoting that, but um, I appreciate what you said about my, you know, my vocal reverb choices. Certainly a lot of thought goes into that. And I mean it when I say reverb is, is uh, this thing of incredible significance to me. Cause I grew up on records like, um, like Depeche Mode and like Trevor Horn's productions and um, and a lot of classical music too. And everything about the music that I grew up listening to, something that was a recurrent theme was how they were set in space. And I, just speaking to Depeche Mode for a second, I've actually, a, a project I've been working on recently is we built a barn here when we were building the studio just to hold all the overflow of materials and my synths and stuff. And so it's a very simple, like quite literally like a country pole barn, right? No drywall, um, nothing, right? But it's a nice barn and it's big. And so uh, a pet project, of, it started as kind of like, oh, you know, to my wife, like, oh yeah, my friend Eric's coming over and we're going to go out and just, we'll be out in the barn. Cut to, we've got like six, six, uh, you know, cat six cables run in conduit, to the barn Dante interface. It's like the barn is going to turn into basically a reverb chamber. So speaking of reverbs, that's why I brought it up. A huge fan of reamping and natural spaces. That's what made me think of Depeche Mode because those records that they made in Germany in the early 80s, they were doing all that reamping stuff where they put a PA in a large room. And then you listen to those records, like Construction Time Again and Broken Frame, and you think, what well, I know these machines. Like I know an SP12, I have one sitting over here, an ARP 2600, whatever. Why do they sound so incredible? That can't just be the noise reduction in the tape and all that compression, you know, analog boards. It, and so much of it is reverb. And so I've always been riveted by space and how it's used to creatively tell a story in a piece of recorded music. And of course, when there are vocals in a piece of music, those are typically the focal point. And so, I, yeah, I take that kind of processing really seriously. So I love outboard reverbs. I love Eurorack reverbs. I love plug-in reverbs. I love reverbs, period. I love natural spaces. And, um, and I use a bit of everything. I guess kind of as a final thought on reverb, I'll just throw out a couple of my favorites. This is pre-neoverb, P.S. I haven't got my hands on this yet, too. So this looks absolutely amazing. And also, too, shout out to the Exponential Audio guys. I know how amazing their digital signal processing algorithms are. They, they just write insane stuff. So I can tell that this reverb is going to be a force of nature. I'm really excited to play around with it. So um, some of my favorite outboard reverbs are the 224XL and the, um, the let's see, the Lexicon 200 is another personal favorite of mine. I'm looking around the room here. The 224 and the 200 are really my go-to outboard reverbs. Of course, they're 12-bit. When I look at them in RX, it's hysterical. There's literally nothing over 10K in those reverbs. And I'm like, how am I swimming in this infinite universe of sound? It's like magic. And it's like a hard wall at 10K. Just wow. can't even believe that that's what is going on with the signal. Um, so uh, I love Sean from Vahala's work in, in the box. is just wonderful reverb algorithms. His new that super massive is something else as such a cool and it's not quite a reverb but with the diffusion up you know you get reverby type things out of it um some things i love in euro rack land are i love the tip top audio zdsp and some of the cards for that for reverb um i love the even tied space um black hole i guess it's called in the box and um 
uh, Big Sky Pedal. Uh, one other favorite is the Empress Reverb. Is and if you guys are into pedals, wow, is that an incredible reverb? So I use all these kind of things when I'm processing vocals, and um, it's irritated some of the people doing remixes from the Lost Art of Longing because they're like, the, all my stems have outboard reverb baked into them and they're like can i have a dry vocal and i'm like yeah you got to come over and print it yourself though because that <laughs> took me like four days to, <laughs> to vocal like it is in the record so um i really do appreciate what you said there because a, a tremendous amount of thought goes into processing um vocals and it's usually two reverbs honestly it's usually i've got that's what's so appealing about something like neoverb i love this idea that you have access to three completely discrete reverb algorithms at once. I'm usually using a room and then some kind of hall algorithm depending for vocals that is. And then I'm using delays as well too, like a short slap and then often something that's rhythmic but that's muted and modulating. But for reverbs, I'm always using two reverbs. So something like this is so cool to me that you have access to three algorithms in one in one plugin is really, really appealing. So, um, yeah. So thanks for saying that. Anyway, I, I'm a huge reverb fanatic. I love right. it. My favorite effect. Right. Obviously. Uh, yeah. we, we could talk about this for a lot, lot more. Well, guys, we've, we've covered a lot today. We we've, we've covered stutter edit too. We've covered the lost art of longing. We've talked about Neo verb. Uh, I, I know I could ask you each like a hundred more questions. It, it's, it's such a great combination to have Josh from the development team um, and VT himself uh, where the, from, from whence the plugin sprang. So uh, th this is a fabulous opportunity. I want to ask if there's anything else you guys want to say uh, about, about Stutter Edit 2, about Neoverb or any tips you want to provide with our audience for music production or, or using plugins. Uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'll go, I'll go second. Um, yeah, no, I, nothing uh, speaks to, I guess to just kind of go back to what I was talking uh, about before, as it pertains to, to music production. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it seems cliche, but um, you know, just really try not to uh, over overthink as much as as uh, it, it may you may initially feel like you should because oftentimes, especially recently, I'm noticing that a lot of the the best uh, mixed decisions I make are made the first time, and then if I spend an hour or so being like, no, that's not right, then I end up just going back to the uh, yeah. initial settings that I had. And sometimes that's important, but I, I, I would say that's just kind of like the big takeaway here. And, you know, that's sort of what our products try to help with is like avoiding that stage and really kind of, you know, giving you a, a target to, to shoot for. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I guess, my big thing. Sure. I think that's great advice. That's something I have to be reminded of constantly. As a music journalist, one I know that I was always seeking uh, from the other side when I would consume articles, videos. I need someone all the time to tell me not to think so much. There is no right way either. If it sounds good to you, it probably sounds good. So I, I think that's great advice, Josh. BT, what, what would you tell our audience? I would say, well, first of all, I love what Josh said. I think that that's great. And, you know, part of the service we provide as musicians and composers and producers and artists is to share, you know, what it is we're carrying around with ourselves emotionally, hopefully to make people feel more connected and, and less alone and convey um, our emotional states and that resonate with an audience and make them feel heard and understood. And a part of that process in being creative is being in a, in a space of fluidity and flow. And I love the idea of not overthinking things. I would sort of categorize it as attachment. And it's part of why I've since I could, which is basically the advent of DAWs. So, but I've been making music since it was just sequencers. Um, you know, have committed things to, well, actually at that time to tape, but now 
to you know a waveform and then like josh said it helps so much with keeping yourself in process and moving that process forward and enjoying the process because i think that ultimately all of those things let me get a little hippie -ish here on you a second i think all of those things ultimately get baked into the music itself and people sense that in some way you know some ephemeral way people sense that when they enjoy or don't enjoy a piece of music is like this idea if you had fun making it you know um so and i strongly believe that we could i could write a little small thesis about that anyway so um so yeah so i love that idea and i just wanted to i wanted to say thank you to you david i really enjoyed doing this you asked great questions and say thanks to josh and like the whole isotope family you know for being a part of this stutter edit journey with me it's just absolutely thrilling it continues i can say no more um and um and yeah i just love hearing this is sort of to the audience at large like i love hearing what you guys and girls are doing with this stuff like hearing it in recordings and in sound design is is like the most thrilling part for me about releasing it even more so than getting to use it on my own work so please post things that you you use it in and um I, I just, it, it means the world to me and I love that people are enjoying it the way that they are. Um, and so, yeah, it's just awesome doing this with you guys today. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, BT. Thank you, Josh. Everyone out there, you hear? BT is listening. Big time. <laughs> That's how he does it. He listens. So listen to me. We were glad to have you here at MixCon 20. Isotope, thank you once again for being a sponsor, for making this amazing talk happen. Everybody, thanks for being a part of it. Leave us some notes in the comments. We're going to have some music from Josh down there too. So keep coming to YouTube, and we will see you next time. All right, take care. Good night. See you guys. <laughs>